Masechet Baba Kama Daf Chaf Zayin. We plan to complete the second pedic and begin the third pedic, the famous Hameniach Etakad. We start off with a series of statements of Rabbah. We saw one at the end of the daf yesterday where uh, someone has a stone on his lap and he stands up and the stone falls and causes damage. And so now we're going to see a few more statements of Rabbah about interesting cases. If one person throws a vessel off of the roof and it's on its way down, it's definitely going to break once once it um, hits the floor. But then a second person comes and while it's midair, he takes a stick and smashes it on the way down. So that second person who smashes it is not liable to pay for it. What's the reason? Because he broke a broken vessel. Even though the vessel technically was intact while it was midair, it was on its way to be broken. And so the first person that threw it off the roof is liable because he threw it off the roof and it was definitely going to break. And so it's considered already broken because we can see the trajectory of where it's going. And the second one made it's true. He made it uh, break a little bit sooner. However, he is not liable for that. If someone throws a vessel, someone else's vessel, off of the roof, but there were cushions or blankets below, so it would have a soft landing and would not break. And then after he threw it off the roof, while it's on its way down, someone else comes and takes away the pillows and cushions. Or he himself, the one who threw it, is able to run down faster than gravity or maybe uses a string and pulls out those cushions uh, from below. And then the vessel smashes on the floor and breaks. The guy who threw threw it off the roof is not liable. What's the reason? Because at the time that he threw it, it was, um, it was, he didn't do anything that would cause it to uh, break. It was the same as um, someone who shoots an arrow and the arrows were stopped. Meaning if I shoot at a target in a safe way and it's going to hit the target and then after I shoot, someone removes the target and then it breaks something behind it. Well, that's not my problem. It's not my fault. At the time that I shot, it was okay. And so we uh, judge a person based on their action at the time that they do the action. And if that would have been fine, then the person is not liable. This would have um, uh, hit the cushions and would not have broken. So the guy who threw it off, it's not his liability. I'll remind you that these are only theoretical. Do not try these examples at home. If someone throws a baby or a child off of the roof and it's going to hit the floor and break something or die, it's bound to die, let's say, and then someone else comes and uh, receives this baby on a sword and it gets impaled on his sword and also dies. Now, who is responsible? The guy who threw it off the roof, he threw a baby off the roof and such as such as such that it was going to die once it hit the floor. So it sounds like he should be responsible. On the other hand, the guy that came uh, that that uh, swooped in there with a sword sticking up to catch the baby on the sword and thereby killing it a little bit sooner, uh, maybe he should be liable. Well, who's liable is a machloket. Pilukta did be Yehuda ben Betera verabana de Tanya. He ku asara ben Adam asara maklot ben bevatahat ben beze aharze kulan peturin. If there are ten people that hit a someone, a victim with 10 sticks and the victim dies, it doesn't matter whether they were all hitting him at the same time or if they did it serially. Uh, Each one person came after the other and hit him. Um, In both cases, they are all not liable because the person died from the collective uh, blows and wounds from all 10. No, you can't single out any one person who is exclusively responsible for killing him. And therefore, according to the banan, we would apply 
apply that also to the case above. Uh, one guy threw the baby off the roof. Another, and so uh, that this partially was going to kill him. And if he did that alone and nothing else happened, he would be liable. But then someone else came and added another factor of the of the sword. But the sword by itself would not have killed him if um, someone didn't throw him off the roof. And so each one by themselves are not fully responsible and therefore they are both uh, exempt uh, from capital punishment for killing him. However, Rabbi Yudah ben Betara Omer, Baze Acharze, Acharon Chaya Mepneshe Kereb Mitator. Rabbi Yudah ben Betara agrees that if they all are beating him at the same time and he dies, then they are exempt. But if it's one after the other, then the last one that beats this victim is liable because he's the one that brought his death closer. If you left him alone, uh, maybe maybe he would have survived from the first nine. Maybe he would have died after a while. But this guy, the last one, is the one that actually caused the death. And the parallel here would be that even though the first guy threw the baby off the roof and would have died, nevertheless, it's the guy who's holding the sword up and catching the child <clears throat> on it um, brought the death closer. So he's the immediate cause of death. And therefore, that guy would be liable. In a similar case, where if um, someone threw the baby of a baby off of the roof, and then my um, uh, ox came and received the baby on its horns, it caught the baby on its horns, but it was impaled and died. So this case would be subject to the to another machloket between these two Tanaim and uh, between the uh, Rabbi Yochanan, um, uh, between Rabbi Ishmael and Rabbanan, as follows. Uh, the Pasuk says regarding a person, if my animal kills someone, I pay ransom. And it says he, the owner of the ox, has to pay ransom for his life. Now, it's not clear who's the pronoun his referring to. If it's the immediately preceding person mentioned, it's the one that pays. That's the owner of the ox, would have to pay for his life. So that sounds like it's talking about his own life. And that would be the opinion of Rabbi Ishmael ben Oshel ben Baruch who says, Deme Mazik. That would make sense that when we understand it as a uh, as redemption for my life, really, I deserve the capital punishment. Even though I didn't kill the person directly, but rather through my ox, nevertheless, that is my, uh, uh, my my ownership, and I should have been more careful. And so really, I deserve the death penalty. Instead, I'm going to pay a redemption for my life, my what my life is worth, and therefore we pay according to the uh, monetary value of the owner of the ox that kills. However, Rabbanan say, no, nafsho is deme nizak, the one that was killed, which also makes sense. Um, if I kill, depending on if I killed a child or an adult or, uh, you know, so depending on the age and all that, um, it's the monetary value of the person, of the victim that was killed, um, because there's an element of compensation here. Um, if it's a person of greater value or lesser value. Uh, therefore, how does this apply to this case? This child who was thrown off the roof on the way down, how much is that child worth? Zero. It's going to die. And therefore, eh, according to the banan that um, I have to pay when my uh, ox goes in and impales the child, I have to pay according to the value of the victim. The victim, as it's uh, falling down from the roof, the roof is not worth anything, and therefore that valuation would be zero. However, if I have to pay according to my value, the owner of the ox, then I would have to pay um, that my value, and so I would be liable. The other Rabbanan said I would not be liable to anything. All right, Vamaraba. Nafal merosh hagag viditka beisha hayabar baadevarim ubivim ube yivim to lo kana. How am I going to explain this case? A guy falls off the roof, and I don't know. I guess for some reason he's not wearing any clothes. And there's a woman down on the floor, lying down, and um, but quite amazingly, he lands right on her and performs an act of intercourse. He doesn't mean to, just that's the way he fell, perfectly 
and penetrates her now and causes her damage. Uh, so uh, the, he is liable to four items. We're going to say which four items he's liable to. Um, we're talking about a case where the person was acting recklessly. It's not just he was on the roof. He's like um, uh, he balancing on the edge of the roof such that even a regular wind would come and he would fall off. So it's not that he jumped. He was not doing this purposely in order to land on someone and ha- cause them harm. It's not exactly on purpose, but it is very reckless. That's the case we're talking about. So that's why he's liable not only to pay for damages, which you, you have to pay, Adam Olam, you always have to pay for damages, even if it's um, not on purpose, even if it's Bish or Geg. But here he has to pay more things because he was so reckless. Now, if it happens to be that the guy landed on and performed intercourse here with his Yevama, right, his, his brother uh, died without children, and now this is his Yevama, it does not perform an act of Yibum because that requires intention that one is having relations. Um, even though Yibum can be done against her will, uh, so that, that's true, but here it's even worse than that because it's not even with anyone's will. He didn't, even he did not intend to perform an act of intercourse with her. It just happened by accident, and so that wouldn't work. Uh, Yibum would work, for example, if he had in mind that he was having relations with someone. He just didn't know that this was the Yevama. He might be he thought it was someone else. It was nighttime. Um, that Yibum would still work because at least he has, he knows he's doing an act, whereas here he's not intending to have relations at all. Okay, so he does not acquire her. Now, regarding the payment, what does, he, what does he have to pay? He has to pay for the amount of the damages, which is he always a person always has to pay for anything, even shogeg, not honest, but um, even if it's by mistake. So certainly for that. He has to pay for her pain, for her medical costs, and for the loss of her livelihood. However, that's only one nezik plus three of the additional ones, uh, but not all four. Aval boshet law. He does not pay, have to pay for her humiliation as a result of this um, incident. Because humiliation, one only has to pay when he intends to cause injury to, to the person. Now this guy, he fell off the roof. It's true he was being reckless, and therefore he has to pay for the other things, but he did not intend to humiliate her. He actually did not even intend to cause her damage directly. Um, it's just that he did, did it very recklessly. And therefore, Boshet is different from the other three. And so Rabba, this is actually a good clarification for the case before, subdivides the case and explains. Um, if someone falls off the roof um, uh, with an uncommon wind. In other words, he's on, you're allowed to be on the roof. People uh, hang out on roofs sometimes, and this like tornado wind comes and lifts him up and throws him off the roof. He was not acting recklessly, um, and he fell down on someone um, and caused, uh, caused damage to the person below and also caused, caused humiliation uh, for, that, for the victim. That person has to pay only nezik, but not anything else. Not for embarrassment, not for pain and medical costs or loss of livelihood. Because this person is totally bish or gig. Um, they were just sitting there, minding their own business on the roof. Now, it's just a little bit dangerous on the roof. I mean, maybe you should realize that it's kind of windy. There is a, a storm. And, you know, this is um, a, a, a little bit dangerous. So it's true. It's negligent. But it's not honest, and um, it's shogeg. It's not, not on purpose, and it's not reckless. Um, therefore, this is the case um, where he would have to pay damages, but not the other four items. However, if he um, is blown off by a common wind, in other words, he's uh, sitting right at the edge, or standing right at the edge, practicing his uh, balance technique, and just a regular wind comes, that person is quite uh, reckless. That's the case we were talking about in, previously. Um, and he caused someone damage and embarrassment. He has to pay only four things, meaning damage, and the other three payments, but not boshet, as we just said. For embarrassment, you don't pay unless you have um, you're, you, you're, you are damaging 
causing damage on purpose. However, let's say the guy on the way down, he's an expert skydiver, and he realizes that he's going to hit the ground without a parachute, and that will be bad. And so he's able to do a tumble sauce midair so that he can land on a person instead, who is a lot softer to land on. And so that would be good be- a be- benefit for him. In that case, he's not, it's not just that he fell by accident, he is purposely directing his fall to land on a person, and that will definitely cause that person um, damages. In that case, the jumper, the faller off the roof has to pay damages and all for uh, other payments, including humiliation, because this is intentional, um, even though he's maybe doing it to break his fall or whatever, but nevertheless, he is acting with intention um, uh, to cause damage, uh, to damage that person on the, uh, below, and therefore has to pay everything. De Tanya, how do we know about this distinction that humiliation is different from the others, that I only pay humiliation if I intend to cause damage? Regarding the pasuk of when there's two men fighting, and then uh, the uh, the wife wife of one of them comes and intervenes, and she sends her hand and grabs his the the other guy's private parts. We ask, why do you have to know, why do you need both statements? If it says, could have just said, Shalcha yada bin bushav. She sends her hand to her, to his private parts. And I would know what's going on. Why do you have to say, and also um, that she, that she uh, grabbed hold of them. Uh, why do you have to say that? To teach. This teaches that she will have to pay because she had in mind to cause damage, even if she didn't have in mind to to humiliate Nessa specifically. So her intention primarily is to stop the men from fighting. And so that's Shashal Chayada. But she knows that by doing this act, it is going to cause damage. This is the Hechazika. So she has to pay all payments, Nezek plus all four, including embarrassment, even though that wasn't her primary purpose to cause him embarrassment, but because she knows that it's going to cause injury, um, and that will include uh, humiliation, uh, so you have to pay all of them. So that's the source that um, uh, if one does not uh, have in mind to cause damage at all, then you don't pay boshet, even if it's reckless. Uh, But if you have in mind to cause damage, even if you're not specifically have, having in mind to cause humiliation. Nevertheless, you do have to pay for the humiliation. If I go and I put a coal on top of someone's chest, on their heart, and it burns through and kills them, and they die, I am not liable because that person should have taken it off, right? If someone puts a coal on your heart, you're going to move it, right? Even First of all, it's going to hurt. You're probably going to move anyway. Um, but even if, let's say, you know, I don't know, you're under anesthesia or something and uh, you see it, you're like, oh, that sound looks like a dangerous thing. I better move it. So therefore, I am not liable even though I did something that caused your death because you could have done something to remove it. However, if it's a case, I don't put it on you, but I put it on your clothing, not the, not while you're wearing it. You have a coat there on the floor, and I put a hot coal on it, and then it burns the entire thing. I am liable, even if you're standing right there, and you could have put out the fire. You could have removed the coal, but you decided not to. I am liable, because it's not your response. You don't have to move it. If I do something that causes damage, and, and, um, and uh, you don't move it, there's a difference between your life, where I'm not liable, and your property, where I am liable. Amarava, Tarvaihu Tenan Hi. Rava, student of Rava, says both of these laws we can derive from a Mishnah. Al Libo Ditnan. The law uh, regarding the coal is from this Mishnah Masechet Sanadin. Kabash Alav le Toch Ha'ur, O le Toch Ha'mayim. Venoya Chola Alot Misham Umet Hayav. If I hold someone in a fire, 
higher or underwater, I hold them holding their head underwater as such that they cannot get up and they die, they fire or they drown, I am liable because I, I mean I killed them with my hands. Um, However, if I push someone into a fire or I push them into a swimming pool, but the person can is perfectly capable of getting out and the person for some reason decides that they're going to remain underwater, uh, that's not my problem. I mean, it's a little bit my problem, but I'm not liable. Um, and so you see, this is the same case as the coal. If I put something on a, some, a coal on someone who's tied up, and they can't get it off, and then kills them. Obviously, I am liable. That's a direct murder. Um, but as long if they can get out of it, even though I put them in that situation, um, uh, then and they don't get themselves out of it, then I am not liable. So that's where we learned the first one. Big da regarding um, uh, the garment or property. Ditnan kera et kesuti shaberet kadi hayav. If someone says, come and tear my garment, break my jug, and I do, I go, I tear their garment and I break their jug, I am liable. Why? Because the person didn't mean to say that I'm not going to pay for it. You know, a person might be saying, go ahead, I dare you, you know, uh, uh, break, break my jar. It means I'm still going to be liable, right? Break it, and um, and you'll be liable. Or if I um, if I say, you know, can I borrow your uh, your this glass? I want to break it for uh, at the end of a wedding. It says, go ahead, break it. That doesn't mean the person said that I'm not going to pay for it, right? It says, yeah, you can break it, but you're going to pay for it. Um, he never said otherwise. So therefore, I am liable. The point is, even though um, the 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 victim here is allowing it to happen, uh, nevertheless. The one who does the act is, li- is liable. So that's the same thing as uh, if someone puts my clothing on fire and I don't put it out. It's like saying, okay, go ahead. You want to put your clo- my clothing on fire? It brings you joy. Um, so, okay, I'll let you do it. But you're still going to have to pay. Um, however, if he says, uh, uh, d- do this on condition that um, you will be uh, exempt from liability, right? Do me a favor. I want you to tear this and I, you will not be liable. Then I am not, then I am not liable for doing it. Um, but, you know, maybe the person for some reason uh, wants this thing to be destroyed. He doesn't like this vessel and says, says, you know, I really want you to, can you do me a favor and break it for me? And don't worry, this will be on condition um, that you are exempt. And he does it. He is exempt. Now that we know that halacha, we're going to try to apply it to a couple of last cases. If someone puts a coal on top of the heart, the chest of a someone's slave. Oh, what about that case? Is a slave considered like, is a, a, like a body of a person or is it like his property? So here, I go, I put a coal on your uh, slave. Now, if I put it on you and uh, you left it and didn't take it off, so then I am, I am exempt. And therefore, if we consider the slave also like your body, because he's also a human being and a person, and he could take it off, and he doesn't, and he dies, so uh, then I would not be liable. Just like if I put it on you, I would not be liable. So to your slave, we're comparing this human person to other human people where I'm not liable. Or a slave, on the other hand, is owned, and it's kind of like property. And in that sense, it would be like if I put, the, put it on your garment, and you don't take it off, where I am liable. So maybe when I put it on your slave and you don't take it off or the slave doesn't take it off, um, but, and the slave dies, maybe I am liable because it's like property, right? Slaves have that funny um, uh, dual definition. It's, it's a human being, but it's also property. Uh, and if you say a slave is in fact like your person, like a body, and I'm not, I, I am exempt because he has free will and he can see what's going on and therefore he should react and move, remove the coal. Well, what if I put coal on your ox and it, it then it kills the ox? Um, what about that case? Do we say that, well, the animal should have removed it uh, from, and because it's, it's going to hurt, or it must say it doesn't hurt, it doesn't feel it. Um, still, right, it could have removed it. You could have removed it, and therefore it's a live being and that has, uh, that has um, uh, sent, sentient and could have removed it, and therefore I'm not liable. Or do we consider an animal the same as clothing? This is simply property. That's uh, a good question. After he raised this dilemma, Rabbi himself answered it. Hadar Pesh. 
Peshtah, Abda, Kegufa, Shara, Kemamona. We'll split the difference. A slave is like a body of a person. Um, he can see what's going on, even if he doesn't feel it and doesn't feel hurt for some reason or takes the pain, right? He can see that this is going to kill him and therefore um, should take it off and I am not liable. Whereas an animal, uh, even though it has feelings, it is not, it can't think through. And if it's not feeling it and, you know, decides to leave it there and the owner leaves it there, um, so then that would be like the owner leaving a coal on the clothing to say, well, yeah, it's going to be, uh, the clothing will be burnt, the ox will be killed, but you did it. And so, you know, I'll let you do it. And then you will have to pay after. Hazran Allah kesad haregel. We now begin the third pedic of Abakama. I think this is the first uh, section of Talmud I ever learned back in sixth grade. Mishnah, ham meniach et akad b'shut harabim, o ba'a acher v'nitkal ba'a ushvara, Patur. Vimhuzakba Bale Havid Chayav Ben Nisko. Someone leaves uh, their jar in the middle of the street, which is not a good idea because, um, you know, that's a dangerous place to leave something like that. And then a pedestrian comes by and trips on it and breaks it. The pedestrian is not liable to pay for the jar. Why do you leave your jar in the middle of the street? That's not where it belongs. Whereas the pedestrian has the perfect right to walk wherever he wants in the public domain. And if the pedestrian not only stumbled and broke the jar, but he also incurred damage, he fell and he broke his arm, um, the owner of the jug has to pay for that he was negligent, even reckless, in putting the jar there in the first place, and therefore he, the owner of the jar has to pay for damages incurred by the um, by the uh, pedestrian. That's the Mishnah Gemara. Patach pekad v'siem behavit. Noticing that the Mishnah starts off with kad, which is a smaller jar, and then uh, in the Sefa talks about bal hechavit, the owner of the barrel, a larger vessel. Uh, why is it switched from kad to chavit? Before we answer that. We notice that there's a pattern in other Mishnayot as well. Utnan name ze ba be chavito ve ze ba be korato nishbera kadosh shel ze be korato shel ze patur patach be chavit ve siem be kad. And later Mishnah says if one person is carrying a a a barrel and another person is carrying a beam and as they're walking they one smashes into the other and the beam uh, smashes the uh, jar um, the owner of the beam is exempt uh, he's just walking and they didn't see that uh, um, the person coming from the other direction uh, with the jar so he is not liable and here we ask how come it starts with chavit and ends with uh, up here and ends with kad Another example, another Mishnah, Utnan Nameh, Ze ba bechavito shel yain, ve ze ba bechado shel devash, nisteka chavit shel devash, ve shafach ze yeno, ve sila ta devash lo tocho, en lo ela secharo, padach bekad ve siyem bechavit. If one person is carrying his chavit, his big barrel of wine, and another person has a jar of honey. Now honey is more expensive than wine. And the chavit, now it switches from kad of devash to chavit of devash, his barrel of honey, it gets a hole in it. And all his honey is pouring out, the, pouring out of the hole. He's losing it. And so this is really bad. The other guy who's very nice of him. He pours out his wine. So in order to empty out his vessel and save the honey since the honey is more valuable. So now the owner of the wine says, listen, I poured out all the wine to save your honey. Can you pay me for the wine? The answer is no, he does not. The owner of the honey does not have to pay the wine. He does have to pay for uh, his uh, his um, uh, value in the trouble that he went through. Right? He uh, had how, how long did that take? Half hour. So you have to pay him as a laborer for a half hour of hard work that he did. In, um, in doing that to save the honey, but since he didn't ask, if he says, the owner of the honey says, hey, can you do me a favor and pour out your wine, right? I will pay you for it. Um, then yes, but if he did it on his own, the owner of the honey says, I didn't ask you to, so I'm under no obligation to pay you for the wine. I will only pay you for the work that you did. Okay, anyway, that Mishnah starts off with Kad of Devash and then continues with Chavit de Shel Devash. So all these cases, 
Um, why does it interchange the words? Papa says Akkad and Chavit are actually the same thing. They can be used interchangeably, or at least in some places they're used interchangeably. They're different words, and so you know some people might use them in a different uh, to apply to a smaller and bigger one, uh, but. Uh, the Mishnah is assuming that they are inter- interchangeable. If so, what does that teach us? Like, well, still, why not be consistent? Um, what does it teach us by using different words? And it makes a difference for buying and selling. If I say, oh, can you um, sell me a, a jar, a kad of honey, and then you give me a chavit, or the other way around. I can't come and say, oh, you broke your word. We had a deal that you were going to go and um, and get a kad for me and bring it here, and you brought a chavit instead, or the other way around, and therefore the deal's off. You can't say that, because kad and chavit are interchangeable. I mean, of course, if one's bigger and you bring more of that, I'll, I'll have to pay for the contents. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about the, uh, the definition of the sale, right? I asked you for this. You gave me something else. No, this is the same thing. Now, what what circumstances would we say that kad and chavit are interchangeable for commercial purposes? If you're talking about in a in a place where they do not call a kad a chavit, nor do they call a chavit a kad, uh, there's a place, there's some places where they're very uh, specific. And kad means some small thing, and the chavit means a large thing, and they never interchange them. Well, if people don't call it that, and I asked you to get me a chavit, and then you come with just a kad, says, no, I didn't ask for that, the deal is off. So that can't be talking about that case. La sericha de rubakaru, and if it's, if, if it's a place, if, a, if they're totally used interchangeably, then there's no chidush. So the chidush is, la sericha de rubakaru la lechada kada, ul chavita chavita. Vikanam de karu la chavita kada, ul chada chavita, maud te ma zil batar ruba. Rather, the, these Mishnayot are assuming a case where most people call a kad a kad and a chavit a chavit. They refer to different things. But there are some, a few people who aren't so careful with their vocabulary, and some people call a chavit a kad and a kad a, and a chavit. I might have thought that we have to follow the majority, that even if you are a peculiar person and you interchange the words, but most people uh, are careful with it, then we should follow the definition of most people. And this teaches us, no, but in monetary matters, we don't go by the majority. We go by the way that a particular person used it. And so, you know, if I always say, Kad, uh, if, uh, to mean Chavit, uh, if I am not careful and I interchange the two, and uh, then you bring me one or the other, so then I cannot have a claim that says, I only meant this, I only meant that. We go by the usage of each particular person. Here we have a really fundamental question. The Mishnah said that if the pedestrian comes and uh, trips over the vessel and breaks it, the pedestrian is not liable. Why is he not liable? A person should examine where he is walking. You're supposed to look where you're, where you're walking, even though you're in the middle of a street. And yes, you have a right to walk there, but you can't just walk with your eyes closed bump into things, cause damage, that's not responsible. You have to look at where you're going. There's a a barrel in the middle of the street. You're supposed to see it. Now, even though the person that put the barrel there is also at fault, okay, he had to rest a little, he had to go to the side, he had to get something. This happens, right? So there is a responsibility of a pedestrian to watch where they're going, and therefore the pedestrian really morally should be liable. This is a really good question. And so now we have three Amoraim who are going to limit the application of the Mishnah. Uh, Rav says that we're talking about a case where the owner of the vessel doesn't just have one vessel, but many vessels, and he fills up the entire street with barrels, such that there's no way for the pedestrian to walk. So, does he have a right to do that? Obviously not. A pedestrian has a right to walk. He sees that the entire path is full of barrels, so he just walks and smashes as he walks, and he's permitted to do that because he has a right to uh, use this as a thoroughfare. That's when 
um, if he, when he smashes them, he is not liable. Shemuel says another scenario we're talking about when it's, when it's dark out. So you came and you put your jar in the middle of the street in the, in the middle of the night. And so how am I supposed to see it? I'm allowed to walk in the nighttime. Uh, it's, you can't tell me I can't walk in the night. So I'm looking, but it's very dark and it's all the way down there. And so I, there's no way I could have seen it. And that's why I am not liable. Rabbi Yochanan says we're talking about a corner, so uh, where uh, you put your vessel right on one corner, and I'm wa- I'm coming from the other direction, perpendicular to that, and so I'm walking, and I turn the corner, and immediately the vessel is right there, and I trip over it and break it. There's no way I could have seen it before because it was not in front of me; it was around around the corner. So you know, if you're going to put something in a spot, um, you don't put it right around the corner where uh, no one will be able to see it. Um, so that's a case where the pedestrian is not liable. Now, all these limitations um, are doing something ra- actually um, quite radical in this interpretation, in their interpretation of the Mishnah. They're saying, in fact, when the Mishnah says that the pedestrian is not liable, the, it's not liable only in uh, these particular cases. But in a regular case where it's daytime and it's not on a corner and it's just one um, uh, vessel there and someone comes and is not looking at where he's going, and uh, trips and breaks it, the pedestrian actually is liable because he should have watched where he's going. So this is a very important case to, um, uh, to register um, as a model. Um, this is a case where the Mishnah says one thing and the Amoraim um, 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 basically limit it to such a, a limited number of cases that they're actually arguing with the Mishnah. They're not going so far to say, to, as to say that the Mishnah is wrong. They can't do that. Amoraim cannot argue against a Mishnah. I mean, the Dav, we do say sometimes the Dav is a Tana or Palig, but um, uh, we, 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 even, even the Dav doesn't uh, usually say that. Um, instead, uh, the, the, the Mishnah itself uh, says that it's the fault, it focuses on the fault of the person putting the jar there. They're at fault, and therefore, the person that walks, he has a total right to walk, and he is not liable. Um, whereas the Amoraim are taking this question so seriously, uh, therefore, actually changing the law in most cases, most applications, uh, such that the person walking. Uh, will be liable and is only not liable, the Mishnah only applies in these particular circumstances. The Papa says the Mishnah is, is exacting in its language only if you follow Shemuel that says it's in the dark or the Yochanan that says it's on the corner. Then I understand it makes sense because he's walking and he trips because he doesn't see it because it's dark or because it's right around the corner. That's why it says that he tripped. But according to that, where the entire thoroughfare is full of vessels, why does it say that he tripped even if he broke it on purpose? Right? You, it, it, could be, it could be that he's not looking. Um, and he's looking at his phone while he's walking and the whole thing is full and he, he breaks them or trips by mistake. But uh, in, in a Rav scenario, even if he breaks it on purpose, um, the the uh, pedestrian would not be liable, right? You come and fill up the whole place. You don't have a right to fill up the whole uh, pathway with jars. I can come, I can come and kick them or or break them on purpose, and I am not liable because I have a right to go. So it wouldn't say nitkal. It would say shavad in the Mishnah if it was the interpretation of Rav. Amar of Zevid Mishmer de Rava who hadin da filu shavad vaytekatani nitkal. Rav Zavid, in the name of Rava, wants to come and save Rav's interpretation that it's, uh, that it's awful. And says, you're right. It really should say Shavad. And it would be true that even if the pedestrian broke it on purpose, he would not be liable for those vessels. So why, is it a, why does it say Nitkal, that he tripped on them? Because it, uh, that's necessary for, their, for the continuation of the Mishnah, where it says, "Vim huzak ba bal hachavit chayab benisko." The davka nitkal aval shavad la my tama who does it can afshe katanidesha nitkal. The continuation of the Mishnah that says, "If the pedestrian was uh, wa- was damaged, let's say he fell down and broke his arm, and then the uh, the owner of the barrel has to pay for." that damage. Now that's true only if the pedestrian fell by mistake. He didn't see it. 
He wasn't watching where he was going, and uh, uh, he didn't see it, and he tripped, and he fell. Um, he didn't break it by mistake, and now he broke his arm too. The owner of the jar has to pay for the broken arm as well. But if the owner, if the pedestrian saw it, and said, what is this doing here? Breaks it on purpose, or if the whole thing is full, and he goes and breaks them on purpose, and then as he's breaking them, let's see, smashing them with his hand, and then he breaks his arm in the course of purposely smashing the vessels, then the owner of the vessel is not liable to pay for the pedestrian's broken hand. Why? Because the pedestrian caused this uh, damage on himself, right? He didn't have to go and be violent and, um, and break things. So he decided to do that. It wasn't an accident um, uh, by, that was caused by the uh, negligence of the person who put the, uh, the jar there that made him fall by mistake, but rather this was a purpose, purposeful act and therefore, although the pedestrian does not have to pay for the broken vessels when it's all full, uh, on the other hand, the owner of the vessels does not have to pay for the broken arm of the pedestrian if he breaks them on purpose. That's why it says nitkal, even though nitkal is not necessary in the resha, it could say shavar in the resha, but it says nitkal in the resha because that is needed for the sefa, which is only true in the case of he, when he fell by mistake, not when he smashed them on purpose. Rabbi Abba told Rav Ashe that here's how they explain the Mishnah in the West, in Eretz Yisrael, in the name of Rabbi Ola, who's in the West. Why is the pedestrian who falls and trips over the, um, the vessel, why is he not liable to pay for it? Because it's not the way of people to look carefully when they're walking on the road. You're walking on the road, you assume that the road is clear. It's not a pedestrian's responsibility to have to look carefully about where they're going. And therefore, the person that puts the vessel there, it's his problem. And uh, he, he will even be liable. Um, if the pedestrian falls and breaks his um, and breaks his arm, and this explains the Mishnah. In other words, in the West over here, they do not give the limitations that we saw above by Rav and Shemuel and Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is actually also from Eretz Yisrael, so we see that even in, within Eretz Yisrael, there is a machloket about it. Um, but anyway, this group of three rabbis, Rabbi Zebavel and Rabbi Yochanan, they basically disagree fundamentally with the assumption of the Mishnah, and they think that the pedestrian does have to watch where he's going. That's exactly what it says here. And therefore, the pedestrian is going to be liable for breaking it. But in the West, and the name of it be Ola, they say, no, a pedestrian is not expected to watch carefully where he's going. And that's why we will apply the case of the Mishnah in general, right? Not only if it's dark, but even if it's daylight, it's right there. Still, the, um, the pedestrian does not have to look where he's going, and the pedestrian does not have to pay for the vessel. Now we have some cases. There was such a case of, uh, like this, in the Harda'a, and Shemuel says the pedestrian has to pay, because it was daytime, not nighttime. And it happened in Pupadita, similar case, and Rava said you have to. Now Shemuel, we understand, he's following his interpretation, as we said before, that um, the Mishnah is only talking about a case of at night, but if it's in the daytime, then the pedestrian has to pay. But does Rava follow the opinion of Shemuel? Papa said, oh, Rava's case was a particular exception where the, the jar was uh, placed at the corner of where an olive press is. And people, they all, they all, even though it's in a, a public area, but people uh, often put their jars there as they're waiting to fill them up for oil. And therefore, since everybody knows that there are jars there, the pedestrian should have been more careful walking near that um, area of the olive press, and he should have watched where he was going. But it's only in that particular case uh, that Rava said that he is liable because he should watch where he's going. But otherwise, if it was a normal case, then it's not the responsibility of the pedestrian to watch where he was going. And if he trips on and falls um, and, and breaks it, the pedestrian would not be liable uh, like the simple reading of the Mishnah. Lastly, Shalach le Rav 
Tzedet Shelosh Esre, the Fanda de Mara, Ul Kofina de Mara, Mai. Rav Chista asked a question to Rav Nachman. What is the amount that we assess for humiliation, um, uh, one that someone causes for another? Boshet. Well, so um, uh, so uh, we know that if it's for kneeing, you stick your knee into someone, that's uh, not so embarrassing. That's only uh, three selah. Uh, for kicking someone, five. Punching someone, 13. But what about if someone takes uh, the uh, a hoe, the handle of the hoe or the top of a hoe, and um, uh, hits his friend with it, that's, that's some, it seems like it's very embarrassing. How much would that, would that be? That's Rav Chista's question to Rav Nachman, who was an expert on these matters. And so Rav Nachman does not answer the question with the number, but rather says, Chista, you're, were you living in Bavel? We're living in Bavel, where we do not have the authority to collect fines. You have to go to a bet in, in, in uh, Israel. And this uh, boshet amount is a fine. It's not damages, it's not repaying a loss, but rather uh, paying for humiliation. So we don't, we don't um, judge these things here in Bavel anyway. But anyway, tell me the details of the case and uh, maybe I can help. And so there, there was a cistern that was owned by two people, Mr. A and B. And they would take turns. Well, on Sunday, A would take from it. On Monday, B would take from it. And they would normally take turns. And then one day, it was really A's turn. And B comes along and is drawing from the cistern. A says, This is my day. Get out of here. B does not pay attention and he continues drawing water. Water, and he's emptying out the cistern. It's causing a loss. Shekal panda de mara A takes a hoe and bangs B on the head or wherever, and uh, st- in order to stop him from stealing his water on the wrong day. And that's the case. Amal there, Rav Nachman said, Me'ah pande be panda le michyeh. And Rav Nachman says, He was right to hit him. He should have hit him a hundred times until he stopped. Not only or should we not impose a fine on A for hitting B, a had, a had the perfect right to hit him. Uh, why? There is a machlok at whether you're allowed to take the law into your own hands. If someone is causing you a loss, can you go and go and uh, grab it back, stop him, hit him until he stops? Are you allowed to do that in general? Well, it is a machlok that they're about to see. But even, if the, even according to the one who says that you can generally cannot take the law into your own hands, if there's an immediate loss happening right now that well, I won't be able to recover, then everyone agrees that I can take the law into my own hands and I can stop the person from causing me injury. So Rav Yehuda in general says, you cannot take the law into your own hands. Rav Nachman, happens to be Rav Nachman who's saying this, um, says that in general you can take the law into your own hands. Someone's doing something wrong. Wrong, you're allowed to stop them, right? They're um, taking something that's yours. You're allowed to stop them. And now, hechad ika peseda, and Rav Nachman is saying all this that when there is a, a immediate loss. Um, that the well, one person will suffer, um, that they won't be able to recover easily. Everyone agrees with me that you can take the law into your own hands. They're only arguing when there is no loss, um, no immediate loss anyway. You know, it's something that you could you know, figure out later. Okay, you took this now, I'll figure it out later. Then you cannot take the law into your own hands. But here, this is immediate loss. He's taking the, the water from the cistern. That's good. It's going to dry up the cistern. This is a big problem. Now, in the general case, Rav Yudah says you can't take the law into your own hands because um, since there is no irrecoverable loss, so fine, go to go to a betin. Right? This guy, um, you know, he, he moved uh, your item, and uh, so uh, don't stop him. Take him to betin, and then you'll recover it later. So it's uh, no no problem. Uh, it's not uh, like he's breaking something that is not. It won't be it won't be able to recover. You'll take him to betin later. And Rav Nachman Namar Avid Inish Dina Lenafshe Dechavan De Bedin Avid La Tarach. Whereas Rav Nachman says, no, a person can take 
the law into his own hands, even if there is not a immediate loss, because um, uh, oh, 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 I, I don't because he could say I don't have to trouble myself to go to Betin. I have to go to Betin. We have to travel there. I have to hire a lawyer. I have to go take uh, take a whole day off to do this. It's a pain. No, I'm going to stop you from causing me harm now. And even though it's something that we could recover uh, later. Uh, it's not my responsibility to have to go through the trouble. I can stop you already from now. Baruch Adonai Amen v'amen.